Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Uh, I'm Irene Di Padua and I'm policy director at Bioenergy Europe and I will be your host for today's event. So I see some people are still connecting, so I suggest we wait a couple of minutes before uh, starting with today's event. But I would already like to thank all our speakers today and also the Commission for uh, uh, giving us the opportunity of hosting the final conference of AgroBioEat within the Green Week partner event. So uh, thank you all for joining and uh, hope we will have a very interesting conversation. I think we can start with the, today's final event. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, again. So if, Francisco, you can go on to the first few slides. Uh, we'll have a very short introduction between, before giving the floor to our keynote speech from a member of the European Parliament, Elsie Katainen. So today, we have quite a packed afternoon. We have a full agenda. We will start, indeed, with an opening speech followed by the, some presentation on the project results by the project coordinators, Mr. Manoli Karampinis. And we will also have Wabayo, which is our Ukrainian partner, which for obvious reasons cannot attend in person today, but they will be connected remotely to give us anyway an overview on the Ukrainian situation and how agrobiomass and non woody biomass can bring a contribution in this context. Then I will give the floor to our distinguished panelists, which are sitting here with me. And we will also open the floor for further questions from the audience, both for those present in person and those connected online. So without further ado, uh, if uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. I would like to say just a few words about Bioenergy Europe. And this is for those of you who are not familiar with the association. We are indeed the European Bioenergy Association based in Brussels. And we represent pretty much the full European value chain having more than 190 members based in different member states, but also beyond Europe. Uh, as you can see, most of them are companies, but this goes from very small companies and family-owned realities to bigger corporates. We do have national associations, but we do also have research and academia representatives. So we do really cover a bit the full spectrum of things. Quickly on the next slide, uh, we have a few internal working groups. One of them is dedicated indeed to non woody biomass or agricultural biomass, but I will not spend much time on this. And in case you want to know more, you can feel free to reach out now after the event or during the cocktail for those that are here. But speaking about agrobiomass, what is agrobiomass? Because indeed uh, already uh, bioenergy in general is a complicated topic. If we look at non woody biomass, we do have a different set of uh, feedstock. The first one is pretty easy, is agricultural residues. This can be either herbaceous or woody ones. And the good thing is that usually for one ton of products, you can get one ton of energy. So it's really a win-win, let's say, <laughs> situation. Another type is uh, the result of agro-industries, so residues following the industrial project process. And this can be, uh, depending on the country, olive stones, nutshells, seeds, uh, considering the full spectrum of industrial products and byproducts. And the final one, and here, of course, you don't need any harvesting because they will be already processed in industrial processes and they will just be available as waste. The last thing is the perennial energy crops. So dedicated energy crops grown especially to produce renewable energy. And again, we have this distinction between herbaceous and woody. So we do have miscanthus or switchgrass, for example, or short rotation copies uh, like poplar, willow, and so on. And here, the, also, the good thing is that indeed, you can also cultivate those kind of energy crops in abandoned land or use them for phytoremediation with you have land which is not fit for food production, for example. And so you can also use them to detoxify, let's say, the, the field. Uh, this should be it for uh, 
the, this first part, I would say, I would like to say a couple of words about the AgroBioEat project. So uh, indeed, this is not just about Bioenergy Europe, but we do have a consortium of partners. Uh, as you can see here, some of them are more technical, like CERT, which Manolis will also present later, uh, CIRSE or BIOS, which is the partner engaged in the technical, like the lab test. Uh, we do have us as a European association, so bringing in the policy perspective, and we do have uh, national multipliers. This is a green energy cluster from Romania, uh, for which we will have a speaker, but unfortunately his flight was delayed, so he will join us soon. Uh, we do have uh, Wabayo, which is Ukrainian association, which will also connect remotely, and we have uh, some other partners, but I don't see the slide, thank you. <laughs> Avebion, which is our Spanish association, uh, AIL, which is a French-based one, Inazo Tajeges, uh, ZEZ, uh, and we do have also specialized partners like Food and Biocluster Denmark, uh, Agroenergy, and White Research, which take care of specific tasks. The project was launched in 2019 and is, I have to say, sadly, <laughs> getting to an end at the end of this month, and it was awarded within Horizon Europe. Um, if you want to have further details, you can either go and check the, the website, or as you have me and Manolis here, you can also ask us. Uh, going on, I think that uh, the last point actually I would like to raise before giving the floor to Elsie is that indeed we have several activities going on uh, within the project. We do support uh, agrobiomass-based agro eating solution and project in new countries. And uh, if you can go ahead. <laughs> and we also uh, just you can maybe go ahead quickly because there are a few <laughs> yes. so indeed we have uh, we promote uh, success cases already existing so already implemented cases but we also uh, want to help other uh, member states countries and local authorities also to implement uh, new uh, agrobiomass plants uh, we do have a series of uh, targeted actions, of which Manolis will set a few more afterwards in the project results. And we do also have communication and dissemination activities. Uh, this is a little bit the big picture. Of course, we can get more into details, but I don't think this is of interest right now. So maybe moving on to the next slide, I would like to ask uh, uh, the MEP to take the floor. So Francisco, if you can help us with that. And... Uh, Hello, can you yes. hear me? Uh, Miss Katainen, hello, thanks for joining us. I can <laughs> hear you and see you very well, and thanks again for, for taking part in this. The floor yeah. is yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you so, so much, Irene, and thank you for uh, AcroBioHeat and BioEnergy Europe for the invitation. I'm delighted to give a keynote speech for this event uh, on AcroBioMass solution in the green transformation. Uh, as you heard, I'm Elsa Katainen, a Finnish member of the European Parliament, working as a vice chair of the Agriculture Committee and a member of the Transport Committee. Agriculture, circular economy and biomass, both forest and agro, are very important in my work. Dear participants, uh, this topic uh, is currently more than relevant in the in the EU decision making tables as, as well as stakeholders agenda. When the Commission proposed the Fit for 55 package, world was very different than now. Transition away from fossil energy is forced to happen quicker than expected due to Russian illegal and brutal invasion in Ukraine. And we must find solutions which are sustainable and renewable to fulfill this demand. Here I see the potential of biomass, both forest-based as well as agrobiomass, as crucially important. Um, as a former dairy farmer, I do know how much raw material can be found from side stream of the farm sector. Um, there are many different sources, from manure to straw and other litter. Uh, the same goes for forests, which cover 75% of our land in Finland. EU's policies on energy should harness the potential of forestry side streams and take into account that this raw material is renewable and has sequestrated the carbon before the energy use. The most important issue now is to fully and efficiently 
open the bottlenecks of legislation for EU's own renewable energy production so that we can get, get rid of our uh, defense of Russia as quickly as possible. Um, currently, the European Parliament is very busy with legislative work on the Fit for 55 package. We have LULUCF, RED, Energy Efficiency, and Deforestation at the final negotiation table, which affect biomass directly. <clears throat> Commission published the Repower EU proposal last month, which uh, amending proposals under negotiation. I welcome Commission's proposal to double the production of biogas, but at the same time, there is there is a bill uh, from some to narrow the possible sources uh, of biogas. This is a very worrying debate. Another difficult issue is red, where we have seen envy committees uh, position trying to limit the bioenergy based on woody biomass out of the scope of renewables. Uh, for me, this is not uh, only against bi biology, but also very harmful for EU secu security of supply. Uh, furthermore, it would also make it impossible for EU to reach uh, the new higher target of renewable energy set in Repower EU. But I want to give you some hope also. Um, we will see in the upcoming votes on Fit for 55 that ENVIS position will be voted again in the plenary. And uh, I'm sure uh, on this issue we will find a better compromise together with other, other committees. Um, I would like to continue a few words about biogas and biomethane. Uh, which are also core themes in my work in transport committee. I'm acting uh, as Renew Europe's, Europe's uh, rapporteur on fuel EU maritime, where EU will make a tremendous shift in maritime sector from current situation, where the sector is still using 98% fossil fuels and where EU's target is to reduce emissions 70 five persons by uh, 2050. Bio LNG is one of the most promising solutions in this transition. And my priority is to secure that this legislation give, gives a clear and predictable pathway for those innovations. As you know, agribiomass <clears throat> agri is the key raw material here. And I think EU should have a here even more holistic approach. It is good that the current cap boosts the biogas production while the core is in food production. But we should in the future have even more harmonized policies to ensure that all side streams in agriculture are used. In this way, we can also speed up the energy transition in the maritime sector. Dear friends, I really want to say that we must pay attention to give incentives for farmers and other, other actors on the sector of agrobiomass to use raw materials rather than reduce these possibilities. People are eager to make their work better, but they need the freedom to develop and the real tools to make it happen. The upcoming proposal on carbon removal certificates, which will put carbon farming into concrete legal framework, is very important uh, one in that sense. Uh, it needs to boost, boost agriculture for more climate-friendly practices, but in a way that food production is part of it and that the funding, funding is market-based. In this way, we will build a true system, uh, which is good for both farmers and for the climate. Harnessing the full potential of biomass from both agriculture and forestry is part of this kind of system. Um, biogas has 
a key role also in the road transport. Here we see a big and sensitive debate in Parliament, which will be solved next week in the plenary vote. The discussion is going on about if biogas cars allowed to be used or not after 2035. Ideally, even if fossil fuels cannot be used further, uh, there would be some flexibilities for the use of biogas. However, when it comes to light duty vehicles, there has uh, unfortunately not really been a strong support for this. However, this is a positive that there seems to be a quite strong consensus uh, that biogas has a role to play in heavy duty vehicles, uh, which are harder to electrify. I welcome this and wait for the proposal from Commission that should be published early next year. We have already now good examples in Finland about dairy trucks, which are using biogas as a fuel produced from agriculture side streams. I hope that Commission will take advance on these solutions. Um, when we talk about the potential of agrobiomass in the green transition, we should also mention the products and the role of renewable biomass in replacing fossil materials. Sugar is here a great, <clears throat> great example. Products from uh, bioethanol uh, to bio-based bottle can be made from sugar biomass. Uh, the same goes for woody biomass. For the European Commission, um, I would like to send a message that it should have a close look on the EU bioeconomy strategy in which benefits and solutions of this substitution effects are well mapped uh, and take these issues into account when negotiations started in European Parliament and between institutions on proposal of EU sustainable products legislation proposed in the end of March. Lastly, I want to say that agro and forest biomass um, also have other than climate benefits. They support the vitality of rural areas, bring jobs and in income to farmers and other local operators. Uh, for the future, we must ensure proper funding and accessibility for horizon projects, innovation and research funding. Also, common agriculture policy has the potential to offer solutions here, um, as we have the second pillar actions on rural development. We already have many solutions. Now it is time to put them on work. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Katainen. Uh, we do have one question from the audience, which is about the support for this kind of initiative. So if the parliament is planning to, to have any concrete support for uh, uh, farmers and uh, indeed agrobiomass businesses of local level. And I think you touched upon this uh, uh, talking about the CAP, the common agricultural policy for sure. But maybe you can tell us a bit more also about your own experience or if you want to comment on this more in general. Yes, thank you. You mean the, could you repeat the, the... Yes, so the question is indeed in the ways that the parliament is planning to support smaller businesses in this, uh, in this context in the rural development, let's say as well. So if you can comment on this. Yeah, yes, the um, pillar two, we are talking about pillar two and rural development, yes. We have many successful uh, programs. You might know LEADER already, which is quite common in whole Europe. It has been working on about 30 years and uh, um, at least in Finland, we have a good uh, experience of uh, LEADER found and what people have done with it. Um, and there is some others which are individual uh, projects. But I 
I'm very happy that um, that uh, uh, development development in uh, rural areas and the money which is meant to that hasn't gone down because there was a, a big big pressure uh, to reduce that money but at the moment at least for example that leader money uh, is a little bit higher in the uh, next few years than earlier so it is in safe if i should say so thank you so much elsie and uh thank you indeed for uh, joining us for this opening speech i see people online are still connecting we have now more than 60 but if you have any questions feel free to write them in the chat and we will address them so Elsie, yeah. if you want, you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, thanks again for uh, your time. Thank you so much. And uh, have a very nice day. I will now give the floor to Manolis to present a little bit the overall results of the project. So please, Manolis. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can see me if you're not here in the room and hear me well. My name is Manuel Serambinis. I'm a research associate at Center for Research and Technology LAS. And for more than three years now, I had the pleasure of coordinating the AgroBioHeat uh, project. It's actually a journey that started uh, more than four years ago, even when we applied for the proposal. Uh, we convinced uh, the evaluators in Horizon 2020 that it was a project worth funding about. So I think today my job is to convince you as well why agrobiomass heating does make sense for the European uh, framework. And uh, we heard from Ms. Katainen before a lot about, uh, for example, the potential of uh, biomass and biogas in the transport sector. Uh, we hear a lot about electricity and the role of wind power and solar power. But uh, as we often say in Bioenergy Europe, uh, there is an elephant in the room of um, the end of the sector, which is the heating consumption. And the heating sector in the EU is more than 80% at the moment fossil-based. I think one of the main strategies, whether it was clearly spoken or implied, was that uh, the heating sector would decarbonize partly with natural gas. I don't think in hindsight that it was a very wise strategy or through electrification. But at the moment, we also have a hard time to supply enough cost-effective electricity to European households. And the heating sector is really where the biomass uh, signs, I would say, in its uh, benefits. And especially in rural areas, the areas in which agrobiomass is, uh, there is a lot of heating oil demand in some countries, like Poland, you hear more about it later, a lot of coal is still being used. Uh, so for sure, there is a big potential to be covered by agrobiomass. Is this working, Francisco? Okay. It's open. The same zone? Okay. So, next one. So, today I will uh, give you a brief overview about the status quo, where we are, uh, what is the biomasses we are considering in this project, uh, what are the benefits and challenges of their utilization, what are the current models for agrobiomass utilization in Europe. Uh, and then I will be saying a few things about what the project did over the last three and a half years, our main achievements, if you like, or the things that we bring forth for the sector to, uh, to progress. Next slide, please. And next one. So I think Irene already explained what types of agrobiomasses we are covering in the project. I'm not going to go into a lot of details apart from adding one important piece of information. Uh, many of the residues or uh, side streams or dedicated crops we are considering uh, have a lot of lignin, so they are not really, really suited for biogas applications for anaerobic digestion. And that is why in this project, we are really focusing more on thermochemical processes, whether they are combustion or gasification processes. I think it's important to know. Biogas, of course, is a key and a very important part for many feedstocks, but it cannot handle very well prunings, for example, from orchards. Next slide. Uh, we hear there are many studies about the, the agrobiomass potential in Europe, but it's always nice to give some concrete uh, numbers just to give you an idea of uh, how much agrobiomass we're really producing. 
So the most potential is actually coming from the herbaceous agricultural residues, straw and maize stalks. And we are talking more than 100 million tons that we can sustainably mobilize in Europe without affecting soil quality. Uh, prunings are mostly relevant for southern European countries, but not necessarily. There are a lot of vineyard prunings all over Europe. Uh, there are several apple uh, orchards in Poland, for example, or Germany. And there, if we are talking about the EU potential, we have around 12 million tons that we can, again, sustainably mobilize. The agro residues are for surely not a, a small market. In some countries like, again, Spain, Greece, and Italy, uh, there are residues from the olive oil uh, production process which have comparable market shares to wood pellets, for example, well-established heating products. And the perennial electric crops, they are things that are coming up more and more. At the moment, they only represent a negligible part of the utilized agricultural land in Europe. So for sure, they cannot be blamed for any food shortages or other issues. And we see a lot of potential uh, for their cultivation, especially in marginal lands, in contaminated lands or lands that are not used so much for other reasons. Next slide. So uh, economics is the beginning of everything. And one of the reasons why we are looking into agrobiomass, apart from the environmental benefits, are purely economics. At the moment, uh, agrobiomass is one of the cheapest energy sources we can mobilize. I'm talking about energy sources for thermal energy production. The slide you see is coming from our Averbium, our Spanish partners in the project. It documents the evolution of the energy prices up to the end of 2021. Things have gotten even worse nowadays. You can already see how electricity is starting to move up. Uh, this is affecting, of course, other products like natural gas, heating oil, and so on. Uh, and But at the very bottom, you see the non-traditional, I would say, biomass assortments, things like wood chips, but also agricultural biomasses like olive stones, which are more commercialized in Spain, or things like pellets from uh, prunings or other assortments, which are at the moment really, really cheap. Of course, the key difficulty here is not that uh, the fuel costs are low, is that you need more specialized equipment to burn agrobiomass. And this is something that we have to take care of. So apart from the econ efforts in using, uh, let's say, more jobs in rural, about uh, new models uh, for development and so on. When it comes to environmental benefits, uh, as you will see, a lot of agrobiomass in Europe, especially the residues, is still being disposed in open field fires, which are very polluting. Uh, but we're also talking about reduction of greenhouse gases from the substitution of fossil fuels in the heating sector. Uh, and later you will see some quantifiable results uh, in the, that we have producing the project. So some challenges I already mentioned that uh, of course agrobiomass is a very cheap fuel, but in order to effectively mobilize it, you need, let's say very modern systems and usually they are more expensive than the standard heating and gas boilers. And that can be a bottleneck, especially for, for example, individual consumers, small companies or municipalities. So one potential way out of this conundrum is to subsidize somehow uh, the capex for the investment. Uh, the residues are, of course, a dispersed resource. So people need to go to the trouble of harvesting them. And this has an impact, of course, on the supply chain economics. Uh, the chemical properties are often quite challenging. So this is the reason why you need special equipment to handle them. Uh, the material can be homogeneous, so you can either have a very robust feeding system or you can upgrade them into briquettes or pellets for easy feeding. Uh, but I think the most important bottlenecks at the moment are the two last ones. The first is, I would say, a lot on the agricultural sector. It is true that uh, the management of the residues is the last priority of the farmer, the same way that in an industry, the management of the residues is the last thing they will think about when starting the production process and then later they have to solve this problem. It is even more difficult on the farmer level because many farmers are small producers that don't mobilize a lot of residues and that is why it is much, much easier for them, for example, to dispose them in open field fires. There are ways around these um, cooperative models, uh, energy community models, of course, are nice vehicles for pooling together agrobiomass resources. 
Uh, but the other thing is also the low priority or low awareness. But this is not only on the farmer side. This is also on the level of the policymakers. Policymakers, unfortunately, don't recognize so much of the potential agrobiomass can offer for decarbonizing. And that is why projects like AgroBioHeat is quite important because we try to engage them, promote and disseminate. Next slide. So I promised I would say a few things about the models for agrobiomass use in Europe. And there is one national champion in Europe. Next slide. Uh, Denmark, built around a specific resource, straw. Straw in Denmark represents around 10% of the renewable energy production. This didn't happen by accident. It was a result of dedicated government policies, as well as an overall restructuring of the agricultural sector, which enabled the mobilization of large volumes of resources. At the moment, there is a big technological industry in Denmark which supplies solutions for straw heating. Uh, and also there are several levels of applications from which start from farm heating, individual farm heating for grain drying or for the heating of a few households, all the way to district heating systems and even CHP plants and power production. And this model, the Danish model, is sometimes replicated in other European areas built on straw utilization, but not on the country level, not even on a regional level. We find individual examples of facilities that are using straw. Next slide. Then we have the agroindustrial residues. Irena said before that they are easily mobilized because they are not, don't have any harvesting costs. So, uh, and this is the most mature market, I would say, for agrobiomass at the moment. Uh, we are talking about olive stones and olive cake in Southern Europe, in Eastern European countries. It's mostly sunflower uh, husk pellets, the residues of the sunflower oil production. But there are many other things that are available on a local level, from nut cells to cotton ginning residues, to pretty much everything that a process industry that is handling the primary agricultural products can generate. A lot of these materials are used by the industries themselves for self-consumption. So it is often the case that these industries are 100% reliant on renewable heat based on these residues. But it is often the case that they have leftover quantities that they can make available for the market. And on these leftover quantities, new uses emerge. Uh, some of these materials are really good in terms of their fuel properties, so they can even be used for residential applications. Some are a bit more challenging, so they find a way to more, uh, let's say, robust and technical uh, solutions, but for sure, all of them can be used for energy production. And in some cases, they can even be certified in the same way that EN Plus certifies wood pellets. Biomass wood, for example, can generate certified olive stones, for, for example. And the final slide for this part, then we have what we are calling the local pioneers. Uh, these are isolated examples at the moment, unfortunately, motivated usually by some visionaries, um, how you call it, disrupting uh, individuals on the local level or regional level, which recognize that there is a big potential in their area that they can somehow mobilize for uh, producing energy, mostly heat, sometimes electricity, if uh, they can, let's say, uh, mobilize the capital for that. Uh, and these are always very local things. Uh, we're talking about supply chains that usually do not exceed 10 or 20 kilometers, uh, covering local energy demands and local energy needs. There are several examples of them in Europe. Uh, we have visited some of them in the project, we have promoted a lot of them, so I won't go into the details of them. Of them but basically, our, one of our ideas in the AgroBioHeat project was to put those cases in the spotlight and try to make them examples for replication in other areas as well, because some of the details might be different, but the general concept holds true. Next slide. Uh, and finally, the last model of, uh, let's say, agrobiomass utilization in Europe, the one that we don't want to talk about, but it's a reality, uh, is the field burning of residues. And field burning of residues is not a thing of the past. And contrary to what I think many people believe, I don't think it's explicitly banned, uh, at least for certain, uh, let's say, assortments uh, in EU or national law. So if you go in the, out in the countryside in the spring in Greece, I have seen it many times, you will see the white smokes coming from the olive groves. I know it happens in Italy and it happens in Spain. The dramatic picture you see on the top is from Ukraine, but it's not from the war. It's, I think, one year earlier. And it's an example of uh, farmers, local people, uh, putting fire to the reeds in a, near the river to dispose of them and clear the area. 
so this is this happening in Europe. It's not a thing of the past. And this is what we should avoid because it's a waste of resources and it generates air pollution. Next one. So what have we done in the project to support uh, the section, the sector, sorry, next one. Uh, so uh, Francisco, maybe you want to do a few clicks here because they are coming up like this. Okay, so what we try to do, we had a pyramid approach in the good sense. Uh, we try to arrange our activities on three layers, depending on also how many people we could support and how many people we could target. The first is developing trust generate proof that agrobiomass heat works, generating vision, so generating also some policy guidelines uh, or policy roadmaps for agrobiomass, especially in the countries in which we have been active. And the final one, and I will be saying a few th more things about that later on, is providing support, especially to specific initiatives that wanted to do something with our agrobiomass resources, essentially, essentially create new local champions, you could say. Next slide. So some of the things we have developed and they are free for everybody to use. One is the Agrobiomass Observatory. You can visit it already on this link. Uh, it's a very nice open map tool uh, where you can find existing cases, hitting cases of agrobiomass utilization. You can find equipment providers, you can find fuel providers, uh, you can find energy service companies and installers for agrobiomass boilers. And the good thing is that many of these points are interconnected. So if you click on a specific equipment manufacturer, for example, you can see the references and see where they have provided their solutions and for which type of fuel. So if you're interested, for example, in a new boiler, you can use this tool to help you find solutions that are suitable for you. Next one. Well, every project produces reports and deliverables. Of course, our project officer is here, so he knows he will have to read them all, but some are, let's say, more relevant for a wider audience. And the ones that we are really proud of is a series of guides. They are focused on specific agricultural resources. We have one on straw, uh, based on Dennis' experience, one on maize residues, which have a huge potential in many parts of Europe, especially Ukraine and elsewhere, and one on the agro-industrial residues, and we have a final one which is in the making about agricultural prunings. The guides are available in English as well as in the other project languages, free to download from the project website. So if you're interested, I very much encourage you to go there and look for them. Next slide. Uh, I said before that we try to promote success cases. So we organized physical when the pandemic allowed us and virtual visits after the pandemic. Uh, we had a very nice visit in Villa Franca del Penedes in Spain, which is an excellent example of how vineyard prunings are mobilized for local heat production. We had very two very big events, one Danish and Ukrainian joint event, and a very nice one about agrobiomass in Romania with, I don't know how many, eight examples of uh, agrobiomass utilization that were promoted in short videos. So uh, next one. And uh, if you want to find more about success cases, we are preparing a lot of materials. A lot is available on YouTube. We have a dedicated playlist. If you Google Lager Biohit, you will find it and you will see examples. We have cases, from example, from the Danish experience, uh, from Greek, Romanian experience, from all the countries we are covering. Um, next one. We organized a very nice series of matchmaking events. I hope that some of you were there. Uh, three of them actually quite successful. Our aim was to create, provide a virtual environment for in which, uh, let's say, people who were looking for solutions could find uh, people who could provide them. So there are many bilateral meetings uh, taking place, a lot of participants. The third act is a version is actually still taking place. You cannot register, but if, if you haven't done so, but you can still request meetings. So we hope that we may be able to create this, could continue the series of events even perhaps beyond the project creation. We'll have to see how this can take place, but uh, it's in our minds. Next one. And of course, many different events, webinars and workshops. I don't even know how many we have organized so far. I have to look it up quite soon because the project ends and we have to report everything. But we have, uh, let's say, promoted the concept not only in the project countries, but also in other European countries that have invited us to give uh, presentations in webinars, but also beyond Europe. We had an excellent collaboration, for example, with the Canada Biomax Cluster in the organization of virtual events. And very recently, we were also invited to present uh, in the Swiss uh, 
AZ, if I remember correctly, a uh, project uh, which has to do with agrobiomass uh, heating in rural China, for example. So um, the, the experience can be transferred in other parts of the globe, of course, for sure. Next one. A bit more technical here. Uh, I know when people are discussing about biomass in general, they worry about emissions. Of course, it's an issue that the sector is aware of and that the progress has been tremendous, let's say. In the wood pellet sector now, you have appliances which are almost, I would say, zero emission. Uh, but uh, there have been some question marks, let's say, about the performance of agrobiomass in boilers. So within the project, we had a bit more technical activity. We organized a series of lab scale tests and some tests in field. Uh, facilities with modern appliances and a wide variety of agrobiomass fuels and we try to measure the results and see how they compare with the eco design regulation if you're not familiar with it it regulates efficiency and emissions at the moment from woody appliances our, our intention was to provide some guidelines for non-woody appliances as well we tested here small scale, I would say, appliances up to 500 kilowatts. Uh, some were quite smaller, so really suited even for domestic applications, I would say. And in the next slide, I have some results, which I don't think we can go into a lot of details at the moment, but uh, because we had also a very nice uh, webinar recently explicitly about the issue, but what we managed. I think is that when it comes to emissions of particular emissions, agrobiomass with appropriate appliances and perhaps secondary measures can uh, perform as well as woody biomass in small scale solutions. The only perhaps exception is the NOx emissions, which is due to the fuel nitrogen content in small scale appliances. We cannot do much in larger appliances. There are solutions uh, for that, but of course, the NOx emissions here are, I would say, at least comparable with the level of the field burning. Next one. So uh, we have also, how much time do I have? I still have time. Okay, thank you. Uh, I said before that one of our core activities was accompanying new agrobiomass initiatives in the different countries. So a very brief summary of the things we have been doing in at least some of the countries. Uh, first slide. So uh, this is an overview. Uh, we have been active in all these three countries. You will hear more about Ukraine later from Georgi, so I won't go into those details. So next one. Yeah, in Greece, for example, we had a very nice project uh, in, in the now some uh, city. It's a wine growing area, one of the most well-known wine growing areas in northern Greece. And there we continued a previous collaboration with the local agricultural cooperative and we brought on board the local municipality. We have worked in a previous project in the concept about mobilization of vineyard prunings. And now we found, we found what we think is a very nice solution for their use. The municipality owns a big swimming pool. Swimming pools are excellent choices for deployment of biomass heating systems because they require a huge amount of energy. So within, let's say, this project, we managed to quantify a bit uh, what solutions they would need, uh, how much they would cost, and what would be the benefit, both in terms of CO2 emission reduction as well as of economic benefits. And here in this project, uh, we can achieve with locally sourced agrobiomasses tremendous fuel savings, more than 80%. Just to give you an idea, at the moment, the municipality is paying more than 100 euros per year, 100,000 euros per year, sorry, for heating oil alone. Uh, and perhaps they will pay more if they continue to operate the swimming pool. Uh, so with uh, even with, let's say, a modern appliance with a quite robust system, we can have a payback time of perhaps three to four years if we have locally sourced vineyard pruning ships, which is very, very good. Of course, the challenge for a municipality is mobilizing capital, especially in Greece, it is not so easy. So we are thinking about potential solutions like, for example, um, an energy service company contract type of contract. And for sure, these solutions can be replicated in other wine producing areas of Europe. Uh, next slide. Similar ideas also in, in Spain. Uh, this one is applied directly to bigger, which uh, could also produce cooling energy with an adsorption sealer uh, coupled with the biomass boiler. Again, you can see, let's say, the levels of the CO2 savings are not necessarily very big to make a difference on 
the European level, but for sure they make a difference on a company level and on a local level. And many, many such small projects pulled together, they can make, of course, an impact and a bigger difference. Next one. Also another project, this one is using a fruit pruning trees for Mozarts in another area of Spain, a small boiler from, I would say, even an individual consumer that is applying a neighborhood for other buildings that um, in locally. Next one. Yeah, again, vineyard prunings used as a co-feeding fuel in a district heating system that uses at the moment wood chips, wood chips are generally, I would say, less expensive than uh, any other biomass sources. But of course, if you go for vinyl pruning chips, you can even reduce uh, expenses even lower. And you can also find the solution for the local management of residues. Next one. Another uh, boiler, let's say, in Spain, and several, uh, a lot of good work from our Spanish colleagues. Uh, a new biomass boiler that would use a wide mixture of uh, agrobiomass and forestry resources that is going to be used also as a potential, um, let's say, good practice examples on the local level so that people can go visit, see, and uh, perhaps implement similar solutions elsewhere. Next one. In Croatia, it's a little different there. Uh, the market is maybe not so well developed for agrobiomass, but also uh, there are still some things that need to be done, for example, in the olive oil production sector. Uh, it's growing. Uh, it's not as big yet, as I understand, compared to Greece or Italy or, or Spain, for sure. Uh, so the management of olive oil residues is still an issue. So one of the companies we are supporting in the project is now uh, implementing a new agro pellets production plan. They're having their own uh, technology uh, for drying, let's say, the material. So the idea is to produce uh, pellets from olive oil residues, from oliformas, as well also from the pruning residues that are available in the Istria region. So olive prunings, vineyard prunings, and so on. There is a facility under construction, and in this project, we help them, let's say, to develop their market, find potential end users. Next one. Yeah, and two examples from Romania, but I think Tihamer will speak more about them very recent, uh, soon uh, in the panel discussion. One is an example in a municipality where there is a discussion about a new biomass system, I guess, in a district heating arrangement that could provide uh, heat to several uh, buildings. It can give good results. You see here a quantification of uh, savings and, of course, generate also CO2 emission reduction. And it can be replicated in a lot of rural municipalities in Romania, more than 2,800 of them that could apply similar concepts. And the final one, which is, I think, a very nice also achievement or that we have in the project, uh, in a small uh, agro-industry, uh, they have already uh, installed a biomass boiler while the project was still running and with the support and assistance and technical expertise of our Romanian colleagues. So we already have a first system installed through the project actions. As I said before, maybe not big to make a difference on the European level, but for sure uh, it's important for the company level and a very nice example for further replication. And next one. And a final example, uh, this happened even before the project. One of our partners, Agronergy, is an energy service company in France. They operate uh, biomass heating systems uh, and they essentially charge the customers for the use of heat. This example is in Seversy, somewhere in, in northern France. Uh, it's a retirement home with about 60 rooms. And there they have a, a, a biomass boiler that is run on Miscanthus. Miscanthus is an energy crop. It is cultivated locally by around three farmers. The farmers harvest it and provide it to agroenergy, which pays them, obviously, for the fuel. Uh, and uh, the agroenergy produces energy in the boiler, and they charge the retirement home with a specific price. Uh, it's a different arrangement. Essentially, the retirement home didn't need to pay anything in terms of investment uh, there. They're just getting a reduced heating bill every month, and everybody is happy. And uh, the energy service company model is something that we are also looking into a bit. And I think it has a lot of potential for application in Europe because it allows, let's say, more specialists to operate boilers while leaving, let's say, the final end users to enjoy the benefits of a reduced heating bill without having to worry about uh, all the, let's say, balance some aspects of the installation. 
And in fact, uh, our French partners in uh, Brittany, IL, are looking into the deployment of such models for the handling of uh, what they call bocas, the, if I say that correctly. It's the hedger prunings, which are um, separate the fields in Brittany, and they are also in other places of Europe. So, uh, in order to wrap up, a few things about social acceptance as well as the impact assessment of agrobiomass heating. With biomass, of course, also we, we are, there are several people from Biomass Europe. We know that, uh, let's say, often it is the case that people complain about biomass or they don't know, let's say, what are the benefits. So, we thought that it would be a good idea in this project to have a more quantifiable, let's say, assessment of what Europeans think about uh, agrobiomass in particular. We organize activities on two levels. The first, if you can go to the next slide, is a, was an EU public survey implemented online already, I think, in the end of 2019 or 2020, if I'm not mistaken, um, through an online platform and through the dissemination of also the partner, partners. We got uh, more than 3,700 responses uh, there. Uh, and what some of the key findings, let's say, that we have from this uh, survey is that generally it seems to be a higher public awareness of agrobiomass in Southern Europe, perhaps understandable because a lot of people are using prunings from olive trees, for example, in fireplaces, or they are familiar with olive oil residues, let's say, for as a heating fuel. Uh, but also, I think the important part is that uh, we found a link between, um, let's say, the higher level of awareness as well as a previous experience seems to indicate that uh, we have better public acceptance. So that tells us that uh, whenever we, let's say, create more examples, whenever people become more familiar with agrobiomass, the easier it is for them to, to accept. So we have what to say a snowball effect, essentially. Uh, the next uh, level are some local telephone surveys that we organized, especially in the areas of the projects we have been supporting. And here I will just give you an example from my own country, from Greece. So next slide. Here we did uh, the survey in two areas, in Nausa, which I mentioned before, and Tinavos, it's another wine growing area. Uh, we collected 600 responses through phone surveys, about half and half in each municipality. Uh, and just to give you some, let's say, highlights here, uh, we asked uh, them what is their opinion about initiatives for uh, agrobiomass heating, real installations that are in Europe. They're nothing, as far as I know, in the local area. And there you can see that there is a majority uh, of a favorable perception. 84% of them were positive or very positive. And the same percentage stayed when we asked them whether these people would be willing to have such an installation quite close by to the place of area of residence. So the not in my backyard, let's say, uh, effect. And again, it remains quite high. 77% of the local people are positive in case such a project materializes, which is something very good. We can go to the local politicians and tell them that people support and understand what are the benefits such a project might have. Next slide. So uh, impact assessment. Um, I did a very simple exercise. As, uh, some days ago, uh, the European Commission published the Repower EU uh, proposal. Uh, it has some goals for hydrogen, for biomethane, but not explicit goals for biomass and bioenergy. So I thought to make a simple exercise, let's say, and see, let's make a simple target. Mobilize 1 million tons of agrobiomass per year. What can we achieve by that? Uh, and we have developed a methodology in the project. Uh, we use it for the, let's say, policy roadmaps on the national level, as well for the impact assessment of the project we are supporting. And the first thing I want to show you is that the reduction of the air pollutants we have. Of course, we have some pollutants from any type of combustion, but the alternative is often the open field burning, which is uncontrollable, obviously. So if you're looking at NOx emissions, carbon monoxide, organic gases, compounds, and particles, if you have a controlled biomass burning, of course, you reduce them by 60, 90, or 80%, depending on the category. Obviously, a much better option. Next slide. Uh, uh, there are two main options. Uh, we can substitute natural gas, or we can substitute heating oil. For most rural applications, uh, at least the ones I'm, I'm familiar with, heating oil is the more, let's say, natural replacement uh, fuel. But in countries like Poland, for example, and other places in Eastern Europe, coal can also be substituted. And of course, the benefits are even higher. 
So by using one million tons of agrobiomass in such installation, and if you substitute heating oil, you can reduce uh, more than one million tons of CO2 in Europe, which is quite nice. That's the, the pooling effect of smaller individual projects I was mentioning before. And the final thing, uh, because uh, we are not only talking about the environment, we have to talk about local people, jobs and GDP impact. So we uh, recently, um, Bioenergy Europe Commission and study with Deloitte about the socioeconomic impacts and economic impacts of bioenergy. We applied the results of this study through, uh, to this, uh, let's say, 1 million tons of agrobiomass. And what we find is that we can generate more than 3,000 uh, jobs in Europe. Uh, many of them are local jobs related to the operating and maintenance of the agrobiomass facilities, for example. So really, really in the countryside. But even the ones that are related to equipment manufacturing and construction are actually European jobs because they are not importing solar panels from China. The biomass boiler companies are mostly, and the, the good ones, I would say most of the good ones at least, they are European uh, and often again in rural areas. Uh, next one, so, and almost final one, concluding remarks. Uh, what does agrobiomass mean for Europe? I'm not going to recap all the previous conclusions and everything. For me, it means that it is still a major untapped renewable energy potential at a time where every kilowatt-hour you can bring in the energy market counts. And it is a sustainable fuel. Uh, it's a renewable fuel. Uh, and it's also a cost-competitive fuel that can be deployed now. We don't need to wait five more years or more before we have agrobiomass solutions on the market. We can have them tomorrow. Who could have them? Who could have them yesterday? But that's another discussion. It's also a vehicle for rural development, uh, as I said before. We can use this to create local jobs on the rural level. We can use it to foster uh, rural growth. And uh, we are talking about European technological solutions for European needs, but also for global needs. Uh, I mentioned before our collaborations with Canada, with uh, China. There are many other markets in which such European technological products could really sign and provide solutions. Uh, what is further needed? Uh, uh, of course, a clear policy vision never hurts to have uh, uh, policy makers that recognize the potential. We need appropriate support measures. I already indicated some, let's say, intervention uh, for policy makers. Maybe we can speak more about them in the panel discussion. And of course, continued efforts in knowledge transfer and dissemination of best practice. Unfortunately, or fortunately, agrobioheat is coming to an end by the end of June. Uh, it has been a very good and challenging sometimes journey, but one that has brought many things. Uh, it would be nice to believe that it has laid some solid foundations on which the agrobiomass heating sector in Europe can proceed. And I think that's all from my side for now, and many thanks for your attention. Yes, thank you, Manolis, for the presentation. Indeed, we have a couple of questions for sure from our online audience, but if anybody in the room also wants to ask a question, don't be shy and we will pass by with a microphone. So, Jeremy, if you can maybe raise the first question. Yes, hello. Uh, so we, the first question from the chat is, uh, have you got any information about the potential of torrefaction in refining agrobiomass? Uh, I know that it has been investigated. There are uh, research organizations like Semner, I think, in Spain and others that have uh, that are looking into this uh, potential. Uh, and also, it is an interesting solution for sure. Uh, the, of course, the, the issue with uh, torrefaction is that uh, you create a, a higher added value product that can be used as a drop-in substitute for uh, Call usually in uh, energy intensive industries, for example, or power generation. Uh, the, the thing is, again, that you before you apply a torrefaction solution, you need to mobilize quite a lot of agrobiomass in order to make uh, sense. Uh, so that is the, perhaps a limiting factor in the application of uh, torrefaction technologies. If you can mobilize enough solutions, for sure, uh, it can make sense. Enough uh, volume, sorry. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So I'm just going to go over to the next question. So uh, a comment saying that the pyrolysis of biomass is an effective technology to produce bioenergy and biochar for many purposes. Uh, was the pyrolysis option included in the agrobioheat project? Uh, 
why we didn't include paralysis as an option in the uh, okay uh, uh, i think that uh, at that time uh, maybe we did not see so much the technological maturity of the of the solution uh, agrobioheat this is a bit more let's say project technical answer is a csa action a coordinated support action which focus on technologies that are ready to be deployed on the market and we saw more potential in uh, let's say the boilers rather than the pyrolysis options but uh, for sure uh, also pyrolysis is a valid path and especially if it can be scaled down and deployed on a local uh, level uh, it can produce results and obviously biochar i think is going to be one of the big things that are coming up in uh, agriculture and bioenergy in general anything else uh, yes, I think we still have one additional question, and then we will have uh, another speaker about thinking this Manolis. Please. Thank you, Manolis. A very interesting presentation. I'm Jean-Marc Josser from uh, Bioenergy Europe. Um, two points. You mentioned that we, as a barrier, we have a lack of awareness of policymakers and farmers. In my opinion, you should also add the lack of awareness of the final users because the farmers will suddenly be interested if there is a demand. So what kind of final users would be the most early adopters? Is it small municipalities or is it more small companies or maybe bigger companies who would like to find alternatives to biogas um, or other kinds of, of users or district heating i don't know there's something uh, kind of the uh, the low-hanging fruits in terms of users and the second point you also didn't mention the ash recycling how far is this important to come with a solution already from the beginning for recycling the ash to the agriculture because this will most probably be a concern that we we uh, we extract minerals and if we dump the ashes it's kind of lost opportunity um thank you yeah maybe i, I will start with the second question first uh, in many of the success cases we have monitored uh, as recycled is featured actually as part of the value chain so it is often the case that uh, the ash is returned back to the fields uh, and deployed there uh, in Denmark for example there are some regulations about the limits of uh, metals in the ash that can be recycled in the fields so perhaps some uh, assortments like fly ash uh, may not be suitable for returning to the field if it has a high concentration of heavy metals, for example, uh, but many others are and are indeed returned uh, on the field. If they are not returned on the field, of course, they can always be disposed. It's not the best option, but easier, let's say, because the volumes are much reduced compared to the initial uh, volume of uh, tonnes of agrobiomass. Uh, for the other part of your question about the end users, yeah, for sure, and there are many end users which have a lack of awareness. Low hanging uh, fruits are, of course, uh, people with a very high heat demands. Uh, greenhouses are usually a early adopters of biomass heating systems. They, they are using biomass for years, many of them, because they understand the, the cost effectiveness of biomass compared to any other uh, solution. Uh, apart from those, uh, these heating systems, of course, are natural, let's say, clients uh, of uh, biomass and bioenergy. They need to supply heat to the customers, they need fuels, so they are using, and we saw an example in Spain in which they substitute one biomass source with agrobiomass. Uh, the really tricky thing is to involve, uh, I would say, end users who can have a benefit but maybe they have it low in their agenda for other reasons like municipalities for example they may have heard about it uh, they may understand in principle the benefits but often it is a reality that they cannot afford to have someone who will bring a project from the start to its conclusion uh, villa franca in spain did it some years ago and now they are a european example which we are uh, showcase and they are proud of that one many other municipalities could follow this example but maybe they they lack the individuals to uh to put it through or to or they don't have access to to the tools this is also an important thing that we need to streamline this information and help uh, them understand that when they are designing let's say or building a swimming pool Maybe you have to go first and evaluate this option before going for the easy one, the heating oil 
and boiler. Apart from that, uh, ma many other, let's say, end users in the rural areas, hotels, for example, are nice end users, but often they don't understand uh, that they could use biomass as a low cost heating uh, option. Small agro industries could also uh, be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, end users, other municipal buildings, uh, schools. We have uh, some examples that we have found in the project that are using agro biomass, but many more could take up this path for sure. Thank you, Manolis. Uh, we have another couple of questions, but as we are five minutes late, I would say we might address them later in the panel. So thanks indeed for your presentation. And uh, maybe we can have an applause for Manolis. <laughs> now, moving forward with our program, I'm really happy to give the floor to Georgi from uh, Wabayo, indeed, the Ukrainian uh, Biomass Association. Uh, Georgi, uh, can you? See and hear us, I guess. So please, I think we will share the slides. Uh, hello to everybody. My name is uh, Georgi Ingelitucha. I'm uh, head of uh, Bioenergy Association of Ukraine. Um, we are established. Um, okay, uh, please, uh, next uh, slide. Uh, we are established uh, nine years ago. Uh, we uh, have uh, 32 companies uh, plus uh, some uh, physical persons as uh, members of association. About half of the players uh, uh, who produce uh, heat from biomass, uh, electricity from biomass, biogas equipment for this are in our association. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, statistics how bioenergy is uh, growing uh, in Ukraine. You see from uh, 2010 till 2020, uh, input of uh, bioenergy increased uh, about three times. And uh, in 2020, we reach a figure 4.4 million uh, ton of oil equivalent. Um, from, from biomass. This is uh, in, in the gas, uh, more than 5 billion cubic meters of gas is replaced already by biomass. And the average uh, annual growth of bioenergy in Ukraine is 11%. That you see it's uh, quite, uh, quite good dynamic. And uh, we believe that uh, figure in 2021 will be even more because uh, prices in 2021 on the traditional energy was, uh, was even higher. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, our estimation of uh, potential for biomass available for energy in Ukraine on the statistics of uh, 2020. Uh, you see totally we estimate uh, our potential as uh, 21 million ton of oil equivalent and uh, two big groups first group uh, which include the straw of uh, grain crops uh, straw of rapes uh, seed uh, byproduct of uh, corn uh, byproduct of sunflower. This is a different type of agricultural uh, residues. You see it's about 43% uh, from total potential. And the second big group, energy crops. We estimate here uh, 2 million hectares of uh, land allocated for energy crops. Uh, in Ukraine, we have 35 million hectares. The two from 35 is not, not so big uh, figure. And we have this land unused at the moment, that it's not competition with the production of uh, food. Then you see uh, also big figure from here. That together, it's uh, like 75% of all our biomass uh, for energy potential is from agriculture. It's uh, quite natural because we are not very forestry country. Our forest is about 15% of territory only, and practically all other is agricultural land. That's why structure of our potential is, is like this. That's why uh, this uh, project was very interesting and very useful for us, because this is exactly about resources which we have in Ukraine. Next slide, please. 
and this no no previous and this is a comparison of cost of different energy carriers in ukraine first column this is a cost in local currency per per per, per 1000 cubic meters if it is gas or per ton if it is coal or per kilowatt hour if it is electricity you see uh, different figures including a uh, different kind of biomass. Second column, this is a uh, lower heating value of these uh, fuels. And third column, this is uh, results of division, first column on the second. And the third column, this is real cost of energy in the different energy carriers in Ukrainian grivnas per gigajoule. And you see the highest figure is for natural gas for industry, 1,194. Uh, also very big figure if we will use electricity for heating, about the same. But uh, these uh, uh, blue figures is uh, from different type of biomass. And you see this is three, even four time, times lower figure than, uh, for example, natural gas for industry. That this is the reason why biomass for, for heating is interesting option, it is feasible option in Ukraine. Next slide. Uh, and this is uh, what uh, our association uh, did in frame of uh, uh, agro bio heat project. Uh, we we uh, developed a um, national strate strate strategic plan for heat production from agrobiomass in Ukraine. We participated in selection and consulting uh, of two ice-breaking projects on agrobiomass for energy. We uh, contributed to creation of observatory or map of the best uh, cases of agrobiomass for heat production. Uh, and uh, this map you see also include Ukraine. Maybe density of uh, Ukrainian projects is no, not so big as Spain, for example, but you see it's also some dozens or maybe about 100 projects already uh, in Ukraine. Then we participated in conducting uh, emission measurements for two operational uh, agrobiomass uh, boilers plan, boiler plants. We, we prepared uh, four videos for the best uh, cases uh, of, uh, of uh, proje projects on agrobiomass in Ukraine. We uh, prepared a brochure on uh, mais uh, residues for energy, and uh, we um, prepared and uh, uh, hold uh, different trainings on uh, heat production from agrobiomass. Next slide. And uh, this is uh, our view on uh, future, on, on strategic plan for uh, agrobiomass uh, use in Ukraine. You see a uh, figure, uh, first line is uh, 2020. This is what we have at the moment from agrobiomass in Ukraine. This is about 50 megawatt electrical, 1,600 megawatt uh, thermal, and replacement of gas, about 1.2 billion cubic meters of gas is already replaced by agrobiomass. Investment is a, about a little bit more than 1 billion euro is already invested in this sector and jobs is uh, 2,800 jobs. And our view is up to 2050, you see approximately 10, 10 times increase in the different uh, different uh, parameters that we believe that uh, agrobiomass uh, will have a good future in Ukraine and uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, profitable from different point of view from uh, replacement of gas from reduction of CO2 from uh, creation of new jobs next slide please and um, we also participated in uh, uh, preparation and uh, holding of uh, 
national policy workshops and uh, advocacy actions. Uh, you see first our national policy workshop was uh, in 2001, physically, uh, 95 persons, uh, uh, and uh, additionally a lot of uh, persons participated uh, um, virtually. And second uh, policy workshop was uh, in uh, January 2022. It was uh, already uh, virtual, online, uh, with uh, 80 participants uh, during this uh, event. Next slide, please. Uh, also, uh, it's, uh, we, we participated in two ice-breaking projects. First uh, is uh, about using of uh, reeds in uh, Kherson region and, uh, and using of these reeds uh, for heating of uh, some buildings with a boiler uh, 200 kilowatt. Not big boiler, and um, this uh, this uh, project uh, we, we this, this project is implemented by a local company, and we helped them in the different stage of harvesting of this uh, uh, agrobiomass and for using in the boiler. Unfortunately, this uh, city Kherson now is occupied by by Russians, and uh, most likely this project is is not operating at the moment. Next slide, please. And the second project uh, also which uh, we helped uh, is uh, about um, using of sunflower husk in, uh, uh, in, in the city of Odessa. And uh, this is uh, for uh, heating of municipal uh, school. Uh, you see it's a 500 kilowatt uh, boiler on uh, such uh, sunflower husk pellets. And uh, this is for replacement of coal, which uh, used at the moment. This type of projects is uh, quite, uh, quite uh, feasible in Ukraine. And um, uh, this company, which we helped uh, in Odessa already doing this, in, in not only in this project, but also in some, uh, in some similar projects, uh, mostly in Odessa. Next slide, please. And also we participated in uh, such uh, uh, emission testing, testing for agro biomass boilers. Uh, we measured uh, CO, NOx, uh, uh, solid particles uh, in uh, two uh, real uh, working uh, boilers. Next slide. Uh, one in uh, Kowel town, 500 kilowatt boiler on the grain waste. This is, uh, you see on this uh, bottom photo, this type of this waste, this is waste from elevator. And uh, on this waste, uh, this boiler is uh, working and we uh, measured uh, emission and found that uh, in most cases, uh, this emission corresponds to Ukrainian norms for emission for this type of boilers. Next slide, please. And the next is uh, also 500 kilowatt uh, boiler uh, operating on the sunflower husk pellets in uh, the city Dnipro uh, for, for heating uh, of uh, military commissariat, uh, say budget organization. And um, it's uh, not so, so good, uh, uh, say, um, emissions in this case, uh, uh, in, in our first visit, but uh, we did uh, some recommendations and uh, this company improved even uh, this, uh, this uh, emission uh, according to our uh, recommendations, and now it's, it's much better. Next slide, please. And uh, also, um, we prepared uh, four videos, and uh, this is uh, about one of the case. This is uh, uh, Odessa region, and uh, 
uh, wine, wine, uh, wine yard uh, prunings, um, combustion for steam boiler on the uh, wine producing uh, factory Chabot. And uh, uh, this is quite successful project operating um, already seven years with uh, Ukrainian boiler, Krieger, Krieger boiler plant. This is a Ukrainian uh, manufacturer. And the um, uh, company is quite happy with this type of uh, boiler and uh, it's quite profitable for them. Next slide, please. And the second project about use of uh, sunflower husk, not pellets, but directly husk, uh, on the company which produce uh, sunflower oil. And uh, this is a steam boiler. You see 4.5 ton of steam per hour. Uh, also with uh, Krieger uh, boiler equipment. Uh, and the um, boiler is in operation from 2020 years, quite quite new, not far from Kyiv region. And uh, all the same situation, company is quite happy with this project. Next, please. And uh, you see these uh, four videos which we prepared and references where you can upload these uh, videos in Ukrainian language, but with uh, English uh, uh, literation uh, with English text. And uh, it's quite popular uh, in Ukraine. A lot of, uh, you see, 8,000 videos, 20, 12,000 uh, videos view, even 27 and 32. It's quite, quite a lot of people who showed this, uh, this video and uh, we hope it helps them to go this way. Next slide, please. And it's uh, also our activity in the project uh, preparation of uh, this uh, brochure, Maize uh, Residues uh, for Energy. Uh, it's uh, prepared in English and translated in seven languages, including the uh, Ukrainian. And it, it is available on, on the website of the project. Uh, please, next slide. slide. Uh, also, we participated in uh, some uh, trainings. Um, one trainings, for example, you see number of participants, 160. And all materials is uh, available, including video and uh, presentations done. And next slides. And uh, some conclusions. Uh, Ukraine has considerable potential of biomass available for energy, including agrobiomass as a major part of this potential. Under the current prices of natural gas, all types of solid biomass are economically competitive with natural gas. And development of bioenergy based on agrobiomass is able to give the opportunity by 2020 to replace more than 14 billion cubic meters of natural gas per year to reduce CO2 emissions uh, by nearly 28 million tons per, per year and to create about 97,000 new jobs. Next slide. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, just one, uh, one more thing. It was not in frame of this project, um, I mean, uh, uh, issue of biomethane, but uh, I would like to add that um, it's also quite hot topic in Ukraine at the moment. We consider that it's uh, very promising for Ukraine uh, biomethane production for internal consumption and for export in EU country. And uh, we are doing a lot at the moment for this, including acceptance of a new law. It is all accepted already. And uh, we hope that uh, it, it will be also success story of uh, biomethane production in Ukraine. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Georgi. And uh, indeed, thanks, first of all, for uh, the overview that you gave, but especially for the work that uh, Wabayo has been doing even in the last few months, uh, everything considered. So that's really impressive. And it brings additional value to have you here, even though not in person, but have you connected with us today. I know there is one question, I think, from the audience. So please. Thank you, uh, Georgi. I see that um, ERBO is very active. I'm, I'm very glad for this. And um, and we are following what is um, happening in, uh, in Ukraine, not only for the war, of course, that we condemn very much. It's completely unacceptable, this Russian uh, aggression, and it's a disaster for the Ukrainian population. Honestly, it's, it's really uh, such a more than a pity. Uh, but the question is, you know this this kind of geopolitical situation now i guess is even making the energy security of ukraine worse because your gas is depending 100 percent on russia i guess so how far are you discussing now the post-war recovery because i guess that you now have realized that many countries are beyond are, are, are behind uh, behind ukraine you are now more than ever on the on the global map there might be some billions of dollars of euro or whatever coming for the recovery after the war um is this other discussions so that Banerjee would play a key role, other discussion at a higher level, at the other political support for Banerjee at the yeah, at a higher level in Ukraine, at least I hope more than Europe, <laughs> uh, so so that really you can have a transition of the energy system in Ukraine, knowing that for the moment you and for the moment until recently we, you were exporting biomass, this uh, sunflower us for example, I exported in large quantities to Europe, so. Definitely, I believe you have a potential, but and you might have the money soon. What is we? Really, what was really the bottleneck until now? So, if this bottleneck of the financing is solved, are we going to see a, a change in the coming months after the war? Of course. Okay, <laughs> it's not easy question, uh, but I will try. Um, uh, fortunately, Ukraine is not 100% dependent from, from Russian gas and from Russian energy carriers. In gas sector, for example, we consume 28 billion cubic meters of gas. From them, 20, we have own gas. And eight, we bought legally not from Russia, mostly from Slovakia. It's original uh, Russian gas, but... Um, we don't buy Russian gas directly from 2014, I think. That, uh, but uh, you're right that uh, we should uh, to do something uh, to replace this. In coal sector situation, even worse, because uh, uh, our coal-rich uh, areas is uh, east of Ukraine, exactly where war is now, and uh, a lot of mines is uh, occupied. Uh, and not available for extraction, at least for Ukrainian uh, consumption. And second problem that our ports on the Black Sea is blocked and we cannot buy coal by, by uh, ships. And uh, that's a really problem what we will do next uh, winter with, uh, with uh, our coal uh, fired stations. Uh, lack of coal is quite quite obvious. Uh, government uh, and and uh, by the way, similar problems with petroleum, with diesel for automobile transport because our biggest uh, producer of petroleum in um, Kramatorsk is uh, destroyed at the moment and uh, port uh, ports uh, blocked. And uh, now we have only automobile transport uh, uh, through Polish uh, and uh, Hungary, Slovakia uh, borders, uh, but it's not so easy to, uh, to transport so big amount. Uh, that government uh, already thinking about uh, our future in energy sector. At the moment, uh, three, three uh, 
say, says this from, from our government. First, we need uh, nuclear, uh, and uh, our nuclear sector is, is working stably at the moment, and uh, uh, first, we need nuclear. Second, we need green, uh, uh, green energy. It's one and second uh, uh, issue from government. It's mentioned uh, also uh, wind, solar, and biomass. And third, uh, we, we should go to green economy. It's, it's a recent uh, document from government uh, uh, what they're thinking can, uh, about the future. That's, it seems uh, we are on, on the good position, I mean bioenergy, because it can replace natural gas, it can uh, input in the coal uh, re replacement, and even in the um, petroleum and diesel replacement. That's why I'm quite positive. We need only to stop war as soon as possible. And of course, we need investments in this sector. We need help and we need investments. Um, a lot of discussion now on the biomethane, uh, um, including for export. Uh, and also a lot of discussion now for using of biomass for heating to replace natural gas because it is uh, originally from Russia, and it is too expensive at the moment. Then uh, I think we, we will see development of bioenergy even with higher rates than I demonstrated in the presentation. Well, thank you, Georgi. That's, uh, well, this final remark in particular, I think is really a positive one. And hopefully uh, next time we'll meet, we will have some better news, not just in terms of bioenergy, but overall on the situation there. So uh, best of luck for that as well. And uh, thank you again for uh, for joining us today. Uh, I would like to have a big applause for Bergi as well. And now without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Tiamer also to join us to the table and uh, to kickstart with our roundtable discussion before concluding today's session. I think we're already having like quite some intense conversation going on, but I'm pretty sure our speaker will bring an additional layer to this discussion. So um, I would like to ask uh, first, well, Barbara to take the floor. Barbara, you come from uh, Poland, from Asket, which is a family owned business. So maybe you can tell us a bit more of what you do, what your business is about. And so please. Okay, uh, if it's working well, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Barbara Pokrzywa, and I represent the company Asket from Poland. Is this fine? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, okay, to, to begin with, I would... Okay. Uh, so to begin it with, I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me to the conference. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, our company is, uh, as you said, a family business. We uh, have almost 40 years of experience uh, in, in business experience and 17 years in the market with uh, woody uh, regarding woody biomass. Uh, we produce machines for uh, processing straw, hay, reed, miscanthus into, into fuel briquettes, and we also uh, make the briquettes. Uh, I brought uh, here with me uh, a briquette. Uh, it's round. Uh, it's 100% natural. It's 8 centimeters in diameter, and it's, uh, it has a hole inside, which is uh, very helpful while combustion because the air can also get inside, so it assures uh, it is fully combusted. Mm, the production of the briquette is very simple. Uh, just the straw is uh, chopped into pieces from one up to five centimeters. Uh, this chopped straw goes into the briquetting chamber where it is heated. Thanks to that, the straw becomes elastic and we can form, uh, form the briquette. And I would say that's it. Uh, the machines that make the briquettes, uh, makes the briquettes is named Biomassa and it's developed by our company. Uh, and it allows for production either hard or soft briquettes. Hard briquettes can uh, be used uh, instead of coal or wood for heating, cooking, or kindling. Uh, and when soft, the briquettes can be used as uh, hygienic livestock bedding. We have a very interesting project 
uh, of that in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, and the last thing that the machines that we produce are either stationary and mobile as well. And the size of the smallest machine is, as I would say, a bit bigger washing machine. So it's uh, not uh, a, big, a big device. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks uh, for bringing some concrete examples of what you're doing. I think that's really interesting. But let me move on to the next speaker, Tayana. You, you have a bit of a double head, let's say, because you're both part of the Croatian Chamber of Agriculture, but you're also representative of EIP Agri, which is the European Innovation Platform for Agriculture, indeed. So maybe you can bring a bit more of the European perspective into the conversation, but I leave you the floor. So please, if you can introduce yourself a bit. Thank you, Irene. My name is Tana Radic. I'm uh, coming from Croatia. Uh, I've been working in Croatian Chamber with farmers uh, for 12 years, uh, mostly on uh, policy issues and international cooperation. We were also involved in a previous project called Up Running that was uh, before uh, AgroBioHeat, uh, and uh, it is good to see continuance of the research uh, and I hope that there will be chance to continue uh, again something uh, in this uh, um, uh, in this kind of project um, I've been working with um, different sectors farmers we have 18 sectors representing 70 uh, 75,000 family farms so each sector has their uh, bottlenecks and they're looking for innovations. Therefore, we applied uh, last year to be part of consortium of EIP Agri and also to uh, exchange knowledge about innovation uh, in different projects. Uh, my job in EIP Agri uh, is um, connected to division uh, that uh, supports social economic farming in rural areas and also to uh, promote employment growth, uh, social inclusion, including bioeconomy in rural areas. What that means, we collect, we do portfolio analysis of the projects that are at European level. Uh, this includes these kind of projects that could be helpful uh, to researchers, farmers, advisors, uh, and at the end, that uh, can be possible to exchange to our workshops, seminars, and focus groups. And we also research needs during our activities. That means that uh, when we connect these projects from uh, Horizon, Interreg, Erasmus, operational groups, and so on, and exchange during our activities, we look what is next, uh, what are the needs that we uh, that are uh, uh, we need to cover in the future activities. That's Thank it. you, Diana, and thanks indeed for joining us. So, Tiamer, you are part of the AgroBioEats project, so maybe you will tell us something about not just the Romanian perspective, but also as a member indeed of AgroBioEats. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation, but also as part of uh, the AgroBioEats um, project. Uh, my name is Tia Mia Shabestian. I'm from uh, Romania, representing the Green Energy Innovative Biomass Cluster, uh, which was established in 2011 with the aim uh, of um, encouraging uh, developing uh, the biomass sector in Romania at that time. And uh, since uh, 2000. 2011, we already installed or let's say established um, about uh, 200 uh, small and medium size uh, biomass to energy uh, projects in different uh, sectors like uh, at public, um, local public authorities, um, providing heat, uh, space heating for, uh, for public buildings, um, for um, uh, forest based industries. Uh, which is also uh, an essential sector in Romania, uh, the wood sector, um, <clears throat> but also uh, agro-food and food industry, which is uh, also, also uh, need um, uh, uh, significant uh, thermal energy sometimes, uh, not only for space heating, but of course, in the technology. Uh, we... Um, Along these activities, uh, we encourage uh, local communities, mostly on rural areas, to establish 
uh, biomass or agrobiomass uh, value chains because uh, sometimes the lack of value chain or uh, um, um, a supply system or, um, uh, with uh, biocombustion material is a barrier uh, uh, in front of the investors. So we encourage them uh, to set up uh, a local or micro regional uh, supply chain. But also uh, we, uh, we encourage uh, young people uh, who are uh, open or will um, set up a startup, a green startup, let's say, producing um, uh, such kind of products uh, for local and domestic uh, markets. So basically that is our, uh, our uh, main activities. Uh, and what is uh, essential is to, in order to, um, uh, to achieve uh, energy self-sufficiency uh, on local level, uh, uh, our goal is to establish uh, energy communities, mostly in rural areas. Thanks. Well, thank you, Tiamre. And I think you gave us a very good connection with our last but definitely not least speaker because you spoke about the food industry. So Eric, you come indeed from uh, Olam, which is uh, uh, the um, uh, food ingredient industry. So please, can you tell us more about your business? Yes, thank you. My, my name is Erik Nederland. I'm from the Netherlands. So it's a very international um, uh, group of people. I'm working for uh, Olam Food Ingredients, which is a global leader in sourcing and processing uh, cocoa, coffee, edible nuts, spices, and dairy which we uh, deliver to our international customers, uh, food and beverage. So I have a background of more than 30 years in um, uh, operations and uh, processing in agriculture. And my previous uh, employers were Tate & Lyle and uh, ADM, big agro companies in, in the world. But since uh, January 21, I'm working as a director of government relations uh, for Europe basically overseeing the impact of uh, European and national legislation uh, on the operations of uh, oil and food ingredients in Europe, uh, like the Green Deal, uh, like the regulation on deforestation and forest degradation, and uh, like the directive on uh, human rights due diligence and uh, corporate governance in the international supply chains. Um, oil and food ingredients is a relatively young company, but it's uh, growing very rapidly. Uh, and we do realize that uh, we can only do this by um, looking at sustainable growth. And sustainable growth is very important, um, both in our international supply chains, because we source a lot of uh, our products uh, in origin countries, like in Africa or in, uh, in, in Asia, but also in our local operations. Um, um, and as, as, as an example, I'd like to mention um, our cocoa industry. I have been working for cocoa for a long time. And in our uh, cocoa operations, we have reached uh, more than 23% uh, CO2 reduction globally, basis um, uh, base year 20, uh, 2017. And if you look at Europe, uh, in our European uh, cocoa operations, we have even reached uh, 56% reduction of uh, CO2 emissions uh, basis uh, a base year 2017. And how have we done that? Um, by purchasing uh, our electricity uh, generated by renewable sources and by performing uh, energy reduction uh, projects, but also by using cocoa shell as a biomass uh, for uh, generating steam. And we are using uh, Vinca uh, biomass boilers for that. So, um, I think it's a good example by walking the talk, uh, and I think we're going to talk more about biomass in the near uh, 30 minutes. For sure, for sure. And as you said, indeed, we have quite a diversified panels, not just in terms of geography, but also in terms of experience. So maybe I would like to ask one more general question to the four of you, and I can start with Diana, if you want to answer, uh, about indeed which are the barriers that you see uh, the deployment and the further development of agrobiomass potential in Europe? So Diana, oh. What's your take on this? Um, okay, I will just say uh, according to the research and uh, what we did in the previous projects and uh, experience from the creation ground and um, also Manolis mentioned creation case, uh, it's first diversity of the land uh, use. Um, that means that uh, in some part of Europe, there are bigger amount of lands and it's easier to collect uh, biomass and it's easier to have logistic. 
and there are some countries that uh, have uh, like uh, 70 parcels in uh, 70 hectares and maybe that's really hard to manage and um, in I would say from creation perspective this was mostly uh, with logistic and knowledge exchange uh, I've seen um, comments from the Commission on Akis on each country, and uh, I can say the half country needs to, more than half country needs to grow in uh, exchange uh, in uh, knowledge. So this would be one of the key uh, uh, issues that should be solved uh, to exchange what is possible um, and what are the solutions according to possibilities of uh, each uh, member state. And uh, that's it. I think indeed uh, knowledge exchange and um, well awareness as well are quite key in this context because I think we mentioned this already in the previous presentation. There is still quite some lack of understanding of what agrobiomass is and which is the potential for that. So I would like to turn to Barbara maybe because indeed Poland has quite a big potential, especially if we look at coal and other fossil fuel production to replace with agricultural biomass. Maybe you can tell us a bit about your as as cat experience, direct experience with using agricultural residues and straw. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so uh, I would like to refer what uh, Tayana said and also what Manoli said before. Uh, I would say the, the basic issue that is blocking the market is the knowledge. I would say the education, uh, it's the base, I would say for every, every project, especially that they are new. Uh, what we still meet is, uh, I would say, the, the information that is based on uh, opinions, not on facts, uh, and on stereotypes, like uh, straw isn't valuable fuel, that it has low caloric value, it burns quickly. And uh, what we observe uh, in many countries that is burning just the straw in the fields, not only in Europe, because there is a high of interest in such a products uh, in, in, uh, in China and in India as well. Uh, so I will uh, the, the, the basic is the knowledge, uh, but uh, I would say there is a light in that tunnel because when we explain uh, the people that buy the briquettes, how they should be combusted, that they should not exceed the temperature 750 degrees, for example. So they are happy with the installation, they are happy with the briquettes, they come back uh, to, the, to buy the uh, to buy the briquettes, but they are mostly the private initiatives. Uh, and I think that uh, to be successful on a larger scale, uh, so this knowledge and the, this awareness uh, of the potential of agrobiomass uh, should be also applied uh, by the policymakers who could uh, also make some rules uh, and uh, how to say, Mm, subsidies, he has to encourage people and farmers to invest in the technology for the pro processing of agrobiomass, not only straw, but others that are national for the countries, uh, and also for the boilers. And uh, speaking of which, I would say that uh, this is also the biggest buyer that the boilers designed for non water biomass are not commonly available. Uh, so, and of course, of the of the proper efficiency, because when we started 17 years uh, years ago with with biomass with straw, uh, we wanted, in fact, to produce uh, electricity. We haven't found uh, such CHP unit, uh, so we just stopped this project. So we started with a very small boiler. This uh, this boiler was 17 kilowatts, and it was uh, designed for uh, wood and for coal. And it served us 15 years. So it was surprisingly for us very, very good experience. So right now we have two boilers, also not very big because they are 20 and 40 kilowatts. They are automated and we are very happy with that. So I would say once they will be more available and with uh, some, some financial support, it will be very good. And uh, the last thing I mentioned is our CHP units. So to produce heat and electricity at the same time from straws, from, from local fuel that are that is uh, available close to the to the people that would like to use it. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. I think it's a, indeed a very good point, the fact that we still need to uh, bring the information to people that straw or other alternative, if you want to call it this way, feedstocks, so non-woody biomass, are still a valuable resource. They are already available. You don't need most of the time harvesting or any way they are already included in a broader process. So that's a very good point. But maybe passing to another alternative feedstock like cocoa. Eric, I'm coming back to you. And maybe you can tell us something more about the emissions of uh, cocoa or maybe something a bit more on the technical aspect of how this compare with the uh, like fossil fuels, for example. Yeah, I will try to answer uh, your question. So uh, at a coal van de Zaan facility in uh, nearby Amsterdam, we are, no, we are now using a cocoa shell, which is basically a residue from our cocoa process, uh, which is normally uh, a waste. 
uh, but which still contains caloric value. We are using the cocoa shell now as a fuel for our biomass boiler, which basically um, uh, is a circular biomass. I mean, we don't need to cut down any trees. It's a residue from a process. We have it on site. We don't need to discharge it. We don't need any trucking to, to bring it to, uh, to a waste um, uh, processor. We can use it ourselves, um, and we are using it ourselves because we we started up uh, the shell boiler uh, end of last year. And what we do see is an annual saving of natural gas of about 7 million cubic meters, which is 50% of our total gas usage. And we are saving also, um, we're reducing the CO2 emissions with for about 12,000 tons. So it's significant. Um, um, and, and again, I want, I want to emphasize it's a circular biomass. It's not cutting down trees. It's a circular biomass. We have another factory, which is for about five kilometers from our Koch on the Zaan facility. We also want to build a shell boiler um, uh, for our other facility. So again, a, a huge saving in my opinion. That's also very good news and great to hear that indeed that it's a competitive solution and it's bringing not just economic, but also environmental benefits overall. So thanks for bringing your, uh, your input, Eric. I know there are some questions from the, or Tiamer, do you want to comment on this? Yes, Please. if I may. Uh, I was about to ask you a question, but you will get it as well <laughs> later. <laughs> If I may add uh, one uh, aspect uh, more. So back to rural areas, uh, the facilities basically are even, uh, uh, they have even lower energy efficiency or they are outdated in general. Uh, and um, um, according to my experience in last uh, five or six years, uh, so between uh, 2014 and 2021, uh, at least in Romania, the agriculture sector or the rural area was uh, focusing on uh, buying new machines like uh, nice uh, tractors with cl climate and uh, climate um, climatization and so on. Uh, but um, uh, the agriculture sector or the farming uh, not focused on how to valorize uh, the residuals or byproducts because it was not considered as as uh, value. And uh, that, is, uh, that is a key uh, element. And nowadays, we are talking about energy security, energy uh, crisis, and so on. Uh, we have to also focus somehow and start, uh, at least uh, I, uh, this is a message for Romania, uh, to, to start a national uh, engagement policy support uh, uh, and launch a new measure uh, for that uh, to, um, uh, to, to update uh, these facilities or at least uh, establish new icebreaker initiatives. Because, of course, we have uh, uh, one, two uh, very good uh, example, but uh, this is not general yet. Thank you. Thank you, Tiamer. And I think I will stay with you indeed, because we have a couple of questions from the audience. So, Jeremy, maybe you can bring them up. <clears throat> yes, Ms. Cantus, we have also other uh, short rotation energy crops, uh, but this is, um, uh, I, uh, I wrote, it, uh, wrote it like this, uh, only stakeholders who are very engaged and they, they have uh, wide uh, knowledge on this, how to deal with this, uh, they uh, invest in, in such crops. In Romania, uh, in 2020, I don't know why, but uh, uh, Ms. Cantus, um, Energy Willow and other uh, 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 things, short rotation crops was uh, eliminated for the, from the list, which is allowed in the agriculture uh, fields, uh, plantation in agriculture fields. Uh, that is okay, but uh, in Romania, uh, the, uh, in the agriculture uh, areas is included also degraded and necultivated areas. So you have no legislation framework, uh, no incentives, no interest uh, to, to move forward in this sector. Thank you indeed, Tiamer. I know there is a question from the audience, so please. Well, hello everyone. First of all, I'm the PO from CINEA. Congratulations to all the team and Manolis. Congratulations also for the coordination. So I have a I have a question for, to something that you've mentioned is the value created by biomass. I'm not an expert in biomass, 
But that, I think that's a key aspect of it. And I would like to know how, how is biomass priced? And now that you're, you're all talking about scaling up biomass, is it sustainable in time to uh, the pricing? And is it an incentive enough for, for rural development? And also, I want to take the chance to ask another question, because uh, this is more for Eric. You mentioned something about emissions. And in my experience uh, working in the energy sector, biomass, I have always seen it as a source of emissions, as of, emissions of course. But more than carbon emissions is particular matters, uh, MPM 2.5, MPM, MPM 10, that can impact the, the rural populations around the plants. I would like to know what technology solutions are involved in your experiences around and about this type of emissions indeed. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll try to uh, first answer your first question. Our biomass is for free because it's a waste uh, residual uh, product of our uh, process. Um, uh, with regard to your second question, I assume you're talking about dust, uh, right? You're talking about dust emission, yeah. So, so we have uh, very uh, innovative uh, dust filters um, uh, installed. And the, the regulations with regard to uh, dust emissions are very uh, severe in the Netherlands, as you might know. Uh, five milligrams per normal cube, and we are far below the five milligrams per normal cube. So with regard to, uh, to the dust emission, uh, by installing the right filters, uh, dust is not an issue at all. Uh, hope that answers your question. Maybe is the other speakers can also comment on the first question of uh, Javier. <laughs> Well, Barbara, yeah. just uh, maybe uh, I would like to uh, tell about the, that agrobiomass potential in Poland is growing. I would say that uh, maybe this could influence also the price because I understand that it was the question uh, about the price of the uh, of the, the. Yeah. Now, now I know it is a waste, so it's considered of not no price, but. If this scales up, if agromass, biomass uh, business starts to be something interesting at, right. at a big scale, right. it will need to mm -hmm. have a price. And I would like to know well, what, what, how are you seeing that and okay. how do you think it can be priced? Mm -hmm. So uh, in fact, in Poland, it's this way that when the uh, I would say there is a demand, the prices rises so quickly that just uh, last uh, yeah, yesterday, just I checked the prices and this straw is not for free. That is the price is just about 150 to up to 200 uh, euro per ton right now, uh, because we can observe it from our side. Just we are also the briquette producers because we have our own uh, land just to test the machine. And also I would say uh, uh, the, the briquette is also uh, our product. And just the last heating season, our sale of the briquette uh, was four times higher than uh, previously. And it was before the war in Ukraine started. So it really shows that the interest and uh, I would say the, the awareness uh, that it is a, a potential is growing. So it's not everywhere common, but still it is growing. So uh, what I can see is say that right now the, the call, it's, uh, I would say, even not available for the private persons that are really accused uh, that everyone would uh, everyone who is interested would like to buy. So it's almost not possible for private people because everything goes to the uh, to the to the professional brands. Uh, so people are looking uh, for alternatives. So uh, I think that in the next heating season, uh, the briquettes could uh, really rise to two hundred up to three hundred euro per ton because the coal will be about 1,000 up to 2,000 euros per ton. So this is really going crazy. And uh, that, that's why I, I cannot say how will be the price because we all are interested to, to know how it will be, but people more focus on what they have close to them. So uh, because we also rented the, the mobile machine, they are very small you could just have a simple car and just to, to have the trailer and to go to your farm and process your straw into briquettes. And right now we have fully booked three months ahead and never happened before. So this is really shows for us that people would like to be independent and to make the, their own stock from their own sources. So if they have the straw for free, so they will use it for their own needs. And if they have some excess, so it will be for sale, I think. So this is what I could say. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Tayana, do you want also to, to comment? Uh, we can give the floor later to Wanolis if you want to speak first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> also because we also have a question from Anolis from uh, oh, the online chat. Reply because uh, the input costs rates for uh, for Han we just uh, look at each other when uh, we discuss about growing uh, from uh, for biomass. Uh, we also have to be aware that input costs for food production raise that directly raise also the uh, biomass. But one of the things which, which is important, uh, this is another resource for production, which helps to stabilize food uh, prices. So it's not just the way, okay, it is energy uh, that they will sell, but it also supports food prices that are increasing and probably it will go even higher so it is really uh, good though and i'm happy when i saw that uh, ukrainians they develop national strategic plan for heat production from agro, uh, from agrobiomass i think this is quite important to have in each member state to see uh, how far is possible to go and to uh, to also to check out how to make a balance between soil and uh, production. So these are something that we also uh, uh, collect good practices from the projects and connect these to help farmers and researchers uh, to find the best solutions, not to take one side and then push another side and then you have a lot of breaks uh, when you don't. Uh, currently, from our perspective, it's really important to help production to decrease the cost, but to also to support uh, the environment. So this is going to be, I think, the highest challenge ever. <laughs> That's an interesting challenge indeed. And it's also very important to connect farmers research and to have a comprehensive approach, not to have indeed the uh, silos, let's say, on this uh, on this topic. Uh, Tiamor, do you want also to comment on this or should I give the floor to Manolis finally? <laughs> And Manolis, then I take the occasion because we also got another question which you might want to answer, which is about the sustainability requirement for agrobiomass. So is there any of uh, any regulatory nature or voluntary mm, requirements for sustainability? So please, Manolis. Okay, first about the, the price uh, question. Unfortunately, you all know that we're living again in inflation times, so everything will go up, including, uh, I guess, the cost of agrobiomass for those who are not lucky enough to, to get it for free. Uh, however, it is a common misconception for many people that uh, it's not worth to collect it or that sometimes it, you pay, let's say, more in petrol or to obtain agrobiomass compared to the energy value that it contains. This is simply not true if your supply chain is local. And uh, the, the experience we have now since the second half of 2021 and the months we are now in 2022 is that the assortments that require, I would say, minimal uh, processing, so things like wood chips, uh, straw in briquettes or bales or whatever, have not been impacted so much in the, in the ways we can monitor them, at least. Uh, first, because they don't are not affected to the same extent by the energy prices compared to other commodities, which require shipping, for example. And also because the markets are more local for the time being. Uh, some other assortments, like the sunflower husk pellets, because they are sourced from Eastern Europe, yeah, they have been affected a bit more. So, and it's a bit more difficult uh, to, to source them. But generally, uh, agrobiomasses, as well as other biomass sources, tend to compress uh, downwards the price level rather than increase it. If there are increases, they are due to competition or because some market actors believe they can increase the prices when everything is going up. Uh, about sustainability requirements, uh, there is Renewable Energy Directive, the second one, uh, which includes sustainability requirements for biomass, including agrobiomass. It covers, uh, I think, facilities of more than 20 megawatts, so the bigger plants, not individual consumers. And uh, there are several requirements, for example, the, the greenhouse gas emissions in the value chain should be at a certain percentage, which is usually not a problem, especially in local chains, as well as consideration about soil sustainability and so on. Again, in most cases, this is not a, a remark, not a problem, and most of the assessments that we perform or other researchers perform about availability of agrobiomass includes um, limitations imposed by the need to maintain the organic soil carbon. So I don't think it's an issue. And also like the one uh, speak on 
from the audience asked about Biosar, for example, there are solutions which can combine, for example, energy production along with increases of the soil carbon in the content. Uh, anything else is on the local level, I would say. Yes, thank you, Manolis, indeed. And uh, in case you want to know more about uh, the Renewable Energy Directive and the uh, other European legislation, we're, of course, happy to answer more in detail, but I don't think this is the moment. I don't want to see the scene from our speakers. So maybe um, going back to, to you, Tayana, since we're talking about the European Union and EIP Agri is indeed a, a platform from, the let's say, the EU level, uh, can you tell Tell us a bit more what are you planning to do as we said that it's important to connect farmers research and keep the different parts engaged so to make sure that you takes advantages of the benefits of non-body biomass so as i mentioned before uh, to put uh, some uh, topic on the table we first look research needs from the previous projects and also we discuss with subgroup of innovation what are the possibilities to uh, do next focus groups, workshops and uh, seminars or brokerage activities. Uh, but uh, for sure, uh, my division is uh, responsible for uh, bioeconomy. And we already proposed uh, this uh, kind of topics, which could be supportive to uh, find the projects that actually show best scenarios, best cases that could be used uh, in the future. Of course, we are all aware that uh, circumstances are not the same like it was uh, last year and everything needs to be a little bit speed up. Uh, um, there are good examples in Europe, but sometimes maybe disconnected. And this is why network uh, is here to support, to connect this knowledge and to connect this uh, as much as possible. Um, I'm not, uh, I can't say, okay, next uh, months we will have these. I know that we proposed the topic land aboundment. Uh, and uh, in this part, there will be partly discussion how to use the land. And also uh, we will have young entrepreneurs. So probably we will take some scenarios, uh, what are young, farm, uh, young entrepreneurs doing in rural areas to support uh, uh, new jobs connected also to green jobs. We see, uh, and it is good uh, that it shows how many new uh, working places could be uh, developed from the use of uh, uh, agrobiomass. And uh, we discussed this from 2016, maybe 2013 <laughs> with Europe running, uh, which was uh, before. And uh, uh, like Manoli said, it was uh, expensive in the eyes of uh, first investments, but in the long term approach, it was good for farmers uh, that uh, uh, entered uh, in the agromass uh, biomass production. Currently, they made circular bioeconomy on their farms, and this crisis didn't hit them in a way. Uh, it hit at others. For instance, uh, our crop producers that started this kind of approach, they use partly for the uh, soil, but also for the pellets to support their uh, uh, storages and so on, together with uh, solars. But this is something uh, what reduce uh, their cost of production. And at the same time, they had uh, something to sell, which helped them to also to uh, lower the level of the food uh, price. So this is why I connected. I see the other panelists are also nodding, so I don't know if someone else wants to comment on this. Otherwise, Barbara, you want to? <laughs> Otherwise, as you're talking about circularity and circular economy, maybe Eric, I can come back to you and uh, because we touched upon this a bit, but perhaps you want to elaborate further on also your di direct experience on this issue. Um... Yeah, again, in, in my view, using your, uh, a residue from your own process, can, can you hear me? Yeah. So using a residue from your own process, in, in my view, is uh, a way of uh, circularity. Yeah? So we don't need to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, cut down trees. It's on, on, on our side. There's no trucking um, re required. So in my view, that's a form of uh, circularity. Um, um, Unfortunately, if you look at the Dutch government, there's a, a growing negative sentiment in the Netherlands uh, towards the use of, um, of, of biomass, uh, maybe other than in other uh, European countries. And so that, that's, um, um, yeah, I also want to um, 
uh, make, make sure and talk to the Dutch uh, government that uh, in, in this case, it's, it's a circular biomass. We don't need to, to cut down any trees. We don't need to truck uh, our shells to, uh, to a waste um, uh, processor. Um, um, there needs to be an exemption uh, for the use of circular biomass, in my view. Thank you, Eric. And uh, I see there is another question from the audience, so please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. This is Eric as well to build on what you, you just said. Um, it's about the potential from um, industry residues because you, you have an experience, of, uh, you, as you said, in a for ADM, Tet and Lyle in cereal oil and, and sugar industry. So you might have a broad overview. So, yeah, two points. You started your project last November. D does it mean that before that, there was no business case for this and then this the situation has changed now with the skyrocketing skyrocketing gas prices that that is so that we might see many other companies using their residues now with more profitable cases and in in and for what kind of product what kind of industries is it coffee residues is it i don't know all crushing residues is it where where do you see any potential and where are we going to see in the future project mushroomings because of the gas price? Yeah, I can only speak for uh, for my time uh, within Olam because um, in the past working for ADM and Tate Lyle, uh, this was not applicable yet. Um, so for sure, cocoa shell is, is a very good um, uh, form of biomass, uh, but also um, Residues from the coffee um, uh, process. But to start with your first question, so we were able to uh, to uh, build this biomass boiler on our Kolgandazan facility due to the fact that it was also subsidized by the Dutch government, and that's the thing uh, now. Uh, the, the the opinion of the Dutch government is changing, uh, which is will also not not so much that uh, we might not get any subsidy anymore uh, in the future, which is not that bad because. Uh, due to the high gas prices, um, uh, there should be a justification uh, as such, yeah? uh, so we don't need any subsidy. Uh, but what I'm afraid of is also uh, that we will not get the env environmental permit anymore in the Netherlands to uh, to build these kind of biomass boilers. Uh, but if you look at the potential, um, what I said, all in food ingredients um, is, is uh, sourcing and processing cocoa, coffee, edible nuts, spices and, um, uh, and dairy. Uh, certainly, uh, for cocoa, coffee, and elbow nuts, uh, we have a lot of um, residue from our process, which can be used um, for um, for biomass. Hopefully, in the Netherlands, but for sure also in the other countries where we are processing these uh, commodities. Uh, hope this answers your question. That's very interesting. But why do you say that uh, that you might not have the permit for this? I see, I hear the emissions of particles are below five milligram is is negligible. So does it mean that the Netherlands govern the government argues that because of the cascading you should do something else with this coconut shell or what is the what what could be the argument? Yeah, it's it's the the cascading principle indeed. Uh, but it's also uh, because in the Netherlands they look at biomass as um, uh, there's not enough knowledge in the Netherlands, in my view, about biomass. I mean, you have different types of biomass. Uh, you have biomass, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the old fashioned biomass, which is uh, wood uh, from, from cutting down trees. Um, in in Kohanazan, we had a visit of uh, the Minister of uh, Nitrogen um, uh, a couple of months ago, and she was really impressed about what we have built uh, on a Kohanazan facility. So. It seems like if you invite people and you show them what we are doing, eh, they're, they're, um, they become much more knowledgeable about the use of uh, circular biomass. Um, so I, I think there's lack of lack of knowledge, uh, especially in the Netherlands, uh, except for when you invite people. And so we should really try to uh, to make more noise and to to uh, tell people that. Uh, circular biomass is not the same as the old-fashioned biomass what we used to, to use. Uh, it's something you have on site and which still has caloric value, which you can perfectly use uh, to generate steam. It's lack of knowledge, in my view. Thank you, Eric. I think the keywords for today's sessions were indeed the knowledge, knowledge exchange, best practices, which is 
what we are doing here today, I think, which is also an added value of this conference. Uh, before concluding our panel, I would like to give each of the speaker uh, one final opportunity to say one last statement or a wish for the future. So if maybe Eric, you can start and then we can just go <laughs> with the uh, order. I, I think I'm repeating myself uh, a bit. Uh, for me, it's important um, uh, in, at EU level, but also at the, the Dutch national government level uh, to, um, um, to look at biomass not as um, uh, a general word biomass but looks specifically at the source what's what's your source of biomass is it something for which you have to cut down trees or uh, is it something you have on site and so again we should uh, work on increasing the knowledge uh, at every level in europe and uh, the national countries in europe thank you eric Thiemer, your final thoughts two final Not thoughts allowed <laughs> <laughs> so one is uh, um, a bad uh, uh, more negative, uh, the other one is uh, more positive. Regarding back to the this uh, topic, regarding to the cascading uh, use or valorization of biomass, uh, the principles uh, are uh, quite nice, uh, very nicely described and so on. But uh, according to our experience, at the end of the day, uh, the price uh, or the costs uh, decide the story. A friend of mine um, running a, a biochar um, uh, industrial, uh, industrial uh, production facility and uh, we also have in Romania a big uh, nut uh, um, uh, producer uh, and the nutshell is uh, not using for biochar production but for uh, production of energy because just because of the price. The positive uh, message um, let's see uh, the positive side of the energy crisis, what is, um, uh, what is here in, on the table. Um, I, um, I see that uh, local uh, stakeholders start to think. That means that uh, landscape um, uh, cleaning or uh, harvesting um, um, agro biomass or uh, agro residuals is starting in many uh, cases, mostly in small and medium size. What I what I know better. So, uh, if they seeing the the energy bills like ten thousand or one hundred thousand uh, uh, euros per per heating season, they start to to look uh, after alternatives. And uh, you know, the under the pressure, we will. Uh, uh, understand or uh, learn uh, of something new. Thank you. Well, let's hope indeed that with the pressure they will <laughs> get ahead farther and faster. Diana, to you. Okay, there is a lot of projects around Europe. Uh, there is no need for ad hoc solutions. Uh, there is just need to uh, collect this and connect uh, this knowledge and exchange this. I didn't mention one barrier that we noticed through a lot of projects. This is language barrier. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, even up running and uh, agrobio he translated in the local languages and that some projects do that. And this is huge effort that should be done uh, during the project because uh, a lot of farmers, especially in rural areas, uh, they're not, uh, they don't speak uh, other languages. They, they speak their own and uh, it's very hard to communicate uh, with them also. I think that these projects will also bring uh, the evidence based uh, for the next decisions. So uh, it, it is good to use results of this kind of projects and then uh, then to make uh, decisions, not uh, uh, just going, yeah, <laughs> let's do it politically. Um, and then uh, regarding circular part, uh, it is highly important to support those who are producing to have circularity on their farms and also to help them with logistic uh, as much as possible to connect them through producer groups or corporations because those who are producing could help us to go out of this uh, crisis and uh, maybe this crisis could be also uh, one wind in our back to change uh, culture that we had uh, now and uh, uh, going in something better uh, to increase new jobs that we didn't think that we could uh, do it. 
And uh, I would say that I'm very happy that EIP recognized the need to involve uh, Eastern part of Europe, since we were lacking uh, with the Horizon project and innovation projects. So part of the our team uh, is uh, from Eastern part of Europe. And also there is a good platform going on where we can reach it via East uh, platform. So there is a lot of research and projects developed that support uh, development of bioeconomy in uh, other countries. So that's all for me. Thank you, Diana. Barbara? Okay. Uh, so just uh, listening to you all, I just can sum up that we all agree that the potential of agrobiomass is on a high level in Europe. It depends of uh, on the country, there are different, different sources. Uh, and it's of the significant meaning. So I think that uh, just using agrobiomass, we could uh, become independent from imported fuels. Uh, so we should focus on, in my opinion, on diversification uh, and uh, on maybe decentralized energy production that will be uh, produced close to the source uh, of, the, of the energy. Uh, and I think that agrobiomass is a must to include it in the renewable energy mix for us to become uh, independent. And I really do hope that the voice of this conference, what we have uh, all been uh, talking about here, uh, will be heard by the, let's say, uh, important uh, persons in the European Parliament and the decision makers, so to transform it into actions. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, please. <laughs> So one last remark from the industry. Uh, we really want to work on sustainability to uh, to reduce our uh, CO2 emissions and to reduce the, the use of fossil fuel. But what we do need is also security from, from the governments. I mean, we cannot invest. Uh, these are costly investments. Uh, um, we cannot invest if we don't get any security from, uh, from governments. Uh, so again, industry wants to uh, become sustainable. Industry wants to reduce uh, the, the use of fossil fuel, but we need security. I think that's the last important uh, remark. That's a very good uh, final remark, I would say, Eric. So thanks for <laughs> bringing this up. And indeed, uh, I think we all agree that uh, predictability and a stable framework is needed for business, for research, for all the actors involved, which doesn't mean less ambition or less sustainability. On the contrary, is indeed to foster sustainability and uh, environmental and climate ambition. But this still needs also to take into account the needs of the different actors involved. So uh, with this, uh, thanks to all the speakers, and I would like to leave the floor to Manolis for wrapping up this session, but thank you indeed. Okay, uh, I think we heard a lot of uh, excellent uh, arguments uh, from the panelists, uh, thanks also to the feedback and the questions from the audience, and I'd like to thank you very much for being here today with us and bringing your point of view. Uh, I have to recap and say a few things about the future of biomass, which I hope it will be as bright as the background of this slide. So um, I, I believe in agrobiomass. I've been believing for many years. I have been working with agrobiomass, I think, since 2006, almost when I started professionally working. And it's nice to see that it's moving ahead day by day, year by year. Uh, but we still have, of course, a, a lot uh, to do. I fully understand the point of um, having a stable legal framework. Uh, it will enable investments. It will unlock a lot of investments. I fully understand the points of circularity. I understand the cascading principle in principle, but I also understand that it's very complicated to be implemented uh, from the top uh, down. Uh, usually it, it's better if it's implemented from the bottom up. Uh, people recognize when there is an opportunity for a value added product. And I have to remind you that energy was not supposed to be a value added product, it was supposed to be cheap. It used to be cheap. And that is why we have to pro continue producing cheap uh, energy. Um, I think that uh, the slide says the future of agrobiomass, but uh, sometimes we have to think a bit about uh, the past as well. Not so long ago, our fathers and mothers, our grandfathers and grandmothers uh, were living in rural areas. Some people still do live in rural areas. And when we have been engaging them through agrobioheat, through uprunning, one of the previous uh, of our forerunner projects, there were still some people uh, who didn't think that this was a modern solution. They remember back the days where there were 
uh, everything on the local level had to be mobilized. So they would have to collect straw, prunings or whatever and use them as a fuel, for example, for cooking or for heating their homes. Of course, back in the days, uh, the technology was much simpler, much more polluting. Uh, if you were in a village, it might have been spelling of manure, for example. So we are not trying to replicate this example. We won't replicate the principle, but with the modern technologies that we now have available. And I think that uh, there are many things in which agrobiomass can be used for commodities, for chemicals, for uh, in many innovative applications. But I think the energy part will remain important because we need a lot of it and uh, we don't have all the, the other solutions readily available now. And that would not be the case. So I think I will close uh, here. Uh, many thanks for everybody who participated, either live or virtually. And for those who are live, we can invite you to a little cocktail. For those who are virtually, I can, we can only drink in your health remotely. Thanks again for everything. <laughs>